My name is Kate Rush. I'm a park ranger at Washita Battlefield National Historic Site in Cheyenne, Oklahoma. One purpose of the park is to promote understanding of the attack and the importance of the diverse perspectives. This is the goal of more than 400 national park sites, to tell all stories of history. Unfortunately, I think one often overlooked topic is the role women play in our history. Here at Washita, we always talk about soldiers and warriors who were brave and courageous. We tend to forget that women who lived on the plains and were involved in battles were just as brave and courageous. Bravery is not just bodily strength and prowess in battle. It is also mental strength to overcome adversity or obstacles. The following are snippets of a few women who played a role at Washita or were involved in the larger story of struggles that transpired between the Southern Great Plains tribes and the U.S. government. But first, let me provide a brief background on the story of the Battle of the Washita. For years, the way to gain status within the Cheyenne tribe and many tribes was to show bravery by participating in battles and raids. When, when chiefs signed treaties with the U.S. government, which limited the land the tribes could use, it made it harder for warriors to gain the tribal status they needed. Rather than attack and raid other tribal villages, warriors would attack and raid white settlements and farms. Attacks and raids on white settlement made the U.S. government react by sending out military troops to quell the raid. Most of these military campaigns were unsuccessful because Plains tribes were more mobile and more familiar with the land than the U.S. military. Since these summer campaigns were unsuccessful, the U.S. government implemented a strategy to strike encampments of Plains Indians during the winter months when they were most vulnerable and least mobile. In November of 1868, Sheridan launched his winter campaign. Lieutenant Colonel George Custer with his 7th Cavalry, approximately 700 men, and Osage Indian Scouts set out to find the raiding tribes camped along the Washita River. After traveling through blizzard conditions and freezing temperature for days, the Osage Scouts came upon a war party's trail in the snow. The trail ran through a small village ahead of them. Custer decided to split his troops into four battalions, surrounding the village before daylight. At dawn, a Cheyenne Indian in the village fired a warning shot that there were soldiers in the area. That warning shot led to Custer's troops storming the village at daybreak. Chaos reigned as Cheyenne fled in every direction, some heading toward the downriver villages, others towards landforms that provided protection. Others tried to escape across the freezing Washita River, but few who tried it were successful. Some who tried were Black Chief Black Kettle and his wife, Medicine Woman Later. Both were killed by soldiers. After the fighting, Custer gathered all the village's supplies and set them on fire. He also gathered the pony herd approximately 850 horses, removed about 100 to 200 of them, and killed the rest. Custer gathered his 53 captives and used them as a shield as they retreated towards camp supply. Custer's first campaign as leader of the 7th Cavalry was complete. Notice, a brief overview of the Battle of the Washita doesn't really include any women. Yet, women were present and involved. Besides the obvious connections, military glory, battlefield tactics, casualties, and ammunition supplies, what about cooking fires, washing laundry, and watching children? These things played a part in battles throughout history. In the Civil War, there were camp followers, mostly women and children who followed their men into war. 
living in camps, cooking food, tending wounds, watching children, and sometimes even going into battle, were all part of camp followers' lives. Doing these menial tasks allowed soldiers or warriors to go off into battle or raids to gain the glory and honor that they craved. If it were not for the actions of women, who would have made the food they took with them on a raid or campaign, or washed or mended the clothing they wore? Cheyenne women held power in villages. While not able to be a part of tribal councils, women were able to make their opinions known to their husbands, their fathers, their brothers, to take to the councils. One of the women who made her opinion known was medicine woman later, Black, Chief Black Kettle's wife. The night before the attack, Black Kettle was holding a council meeting because he had just returned from Fort Cobb, seeking protection for his band. Medicine Woman later wanted to move their village further downstream, closer to the, the protection of the other villages located there, after hearing that soldiers were near. According to Moving Behind, in 1937, Medicine Woman later said that night, I don't like this delay. We could have moved long ago. The agent sent word for us to leave at once. It seems we are crazy and deaf and cannot hear. During the evening of November 26th, 1868, she stood outside Black Kettle's lodge while he and other chiefs ruminated over what to do. She chastised them for not moving the camp downriver. Had the council agreed to move the village, history may have been changed. During the battle, Cheyenne women showed courage and bravery through a variety of actions. Custer's orders were to kill all warriors and capture all the women and children. Moving behind in her aunt, Cornstalk woman, fled and found a place to hide in the tall grass during the attack. While they were hiding, a soldier spotted them. Instead of capturing them, he let them be. Many years later, George Bent asked moving behind to meet this same soldier. She said of that meeting, we shook hands with the tall soldier. I recall that he had a brown mustache and blue eyes. White Buffalo women fled with a group of children but were caught by Major Joel Elliott. Major Elliott sent the group back towards the village under the command of Sergeant Major Walter Kennedy. On their return to the village, White Buffalo Woman devised a ruse to slow down Kennedy by stopping and bandaging the children's feet with pieces from her own clothing. This allowed Arapaho warriors to, from downriver to catch up and kill Kennedy, allowing the women and children to escape. White Buffalo Woman's story was passed down from generation to generation by familial land familial lines and shared with Washita by Dr. Henrietta Mann, the great-granddaughter of White Buffalo Woman. Women and children who were taken captive had to show their bravery and strength constantly. They were forced to assist soldiers in gathering the Cheyenne pony herd, only to see them slaughtered in front of them. An elderly injured woman brandished a knife, threatening a soldier until a translator convinced the Cheyenne woman that no further harm would come to her. She had to trust their words. In total, 53 women and children were taken captive by the 7th Cavalry. These captives were first taken to Camp Supply and eventually on to Fort Hayes in Kansas, where they were held for seven months before returning back to their people. Imagine being a prisoner of war, not knowing if you will ever be released. These captives who were taken to Fort Hayes showed courage during their captivity. One captive, Monacita, also known as Maozi, became a translator for Custer. She showed great courage traveling with Custer on expeditions. It is well known that Custer had a relationship with her as well. 
This relationship spared Custer's body from mutilation at the Battle of Little Bighorn because the women said that he was Maotzi's husband. Moissa, another Cheyenne captive, was also employed by Custer as an emissary to determine the whereabouts and the condition of the Cheyennes. White women also played a role in the Battle of the Washita, or a part of a larger story. For many women, moving west and living among people who were different than you was an act of bravery. For Clara Blinn, Anna Morgan, and Sarah White, their journeys were much different than many westward-bound women. These three were captured by Cheyenne and Arapaho tribesmen during the summer raids that led to the winter campaign and the attack at Washita. During the battle, Anna and Sarah were in Cheyenne Chief Whirlwind's village, which was further downstream from Black Kettles. A few months after the Battle of the Washita, both women were released from captivity to the 7th Cavalry. On November 7th, 20 days prior to the Washita attack, Cheyenne Jack, an employee at the trading post at Fort Cobb, located Claire Blinn and her son in Yellow Bear's Arapaho camp, which was nearby Black Kettle's camp. Clara sent a message for help with Jack, which was passed on to Colonel William Hazen, a special military agent who had just arrived at Fort Cobb, the same fort Black Kettle visited. Hazen authorized the negotiation for the release of the Blinn captives. Unfortunately, before Clara and her son Willie could be rescued, both were killed by the Arapaho during the Washita fight. The soldiers did enjoy the company of one Irish woman, Mrs. Courtenay. She must have been brave to endure the winter conditions and life as a soldier's wife. Mrs. Courtenay was one of the laundresses for Troop F and Custer's cook during the campaign. After the battle, she worked with Naozi on her daily duties and taught her to speak English. Life on the plains or western frontier was not easy for women. It required them to be self-reliant, independent, and hardy. Women from the east learned to adapt and re-examine the stereotypes they had lived with in the east to the people around them. The immigrant soldiers, the servants, the traders, the tribes people. Tribes women also had to adapt and change to life on the plains. Life on a reservation was very different from traditional life ways. And they also had to adapt to the immigrant soldiers, the traders, and the settlers on the plains as well. Both women, whites and Cheyenne, had to tolerate physical discomforts as well as the mental strength to overcome adversity. I feel Sarah White, after her captivity within a Cheyenne camp, understood it best as quoted by E.F. Hollibaugh from his interview. When she hears people complaining of hardships and hard times, she often thinks their knowledge along these lines is very limited. Let's not forget that some of history's greatest stories may not be those written down or come from men, but are rather oral traditions and are her stories.